Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Blit, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. The orphans bond a family that very few can understand. Help me. Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or Whatever Movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother, Sexual Chocolate Wesley. himself. <laughs> no. <laughs> we are hot off the presses. We are reviewing Amazon original movie, Coming to America. <laughs> Wes, did you know that the Paramount Mountain is the highest peak in Zamunda? Uh, is it called Paramount Peak or did they rename it? <laughs> they stunted the Paramount logo and made it a mountain or mountain range in Zamunda. That was pretty cool. I got it. It was the second time they did it, though. They did it in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Apparently, it's an, there's an identical sister peak in South America somewhere. <laughs> oh, so this is old hat. Does that just foreshadow everything about coming to America, that it's all recycled? I don't know, man. I was holding on tight. I jumped up, turned it on, and I was like, give it to me! It's not possible for this movie to live up to the hype. Yeah, and they said as much in the dialogue between the young bastard son and his would-be <laughs> wife. Sequels that don't live up to their predecessors. Barbershop and Beauty Shop and whatever else they were talking about. It was pretty on the nose. It's been done before. This self-aware, self-referential kind of thing, particularly in Cobra Kai, which brings everybody back that's still alive. It And it has cell phones and a self-referential. It's not funny it Clever becomes obvious cute and you would have thought that this one i was like oh man they're treading dangerous ground by being self-referential by not really pushing the the story forward in a way that doesn't include every single person who appeared in the first one everybody makes a cameo everybody who is available alive still working makes a cameo in this movie and they made sure those cameos happened in, within the first five minutes of this film they went hard you know whereas there was dance numbers <laughs> Like I have, I was like, I wonder if Paula Abdul choreographed this dance number. I wonder, maybe Paula Abdul will make some kind of cameo. And then they had all the cameos. It wasn't just En Vogue with Salt and Peppa. Gladys Knight showed up. It's like, we need a continuous soundtrack. And the soundtrack in Zamunda, if you're a prince or the king, is entirely live. <laughs> Don't forget the uh, credit sequence cameo by John Legend. <laughs> <laughs> which, which honestly was funny. And so I guess that was going to be my point, was that everything they did, usually it's paper thin and you can really see the desperation in the trying. Like, hey, get it? We're, we're like the old movie, you get it? But I consistently laughed. And the uh, the product placement gag, of which there were several. Pepsi being the official drink of Zamunda. <laughs> I didn't that was think wild. it was unfunny up top. So it didn't turn you off right away. But did it get old? Like I actually laughed. Uh, I was like, did he say Nextoria and the Nextorians? <laughs> and I couldn't help. And I thought, you know what? This movie knows its place. It knows what we want. Let's see how well it can sustain it. And then it didn't quite sustain it in the way I hoped. And I wonder, I'm guessing the same was probably for you. And I wonder if we hit that cruising altitude around the same time. That the self-referentialness reached the saturation point because that's how it felt for me well you, there's the gimmicky thing of being able to like how closely can we match this or how much can we bring back from the first movie like 33 years ago and then what new story are we telling we got everybody back that's hilarious what else you got i was like oh ha when paul bates walks on screen and i was really excited and so there were there were only good surprises given that some of the people couldn't recur but i was like how are they gonna work are they gonna is uh is mcdowell still hanging around and not right. only was mcdowell around but he was at mcdowell's with louis anderson yeah with maurice like still doing his thing in the uh, modified african version of the mcdowell's uniform 
Yep. I was surprised they didn't have Sam Jackson as like a palace servant or something. Like an indenture <laughs> servant working off his prison sentence, cleaning up the new McDowells. That would have been a good cameo, but I think they made up for a lack of a few cameos with new appearances by Morgan Freeman, by um, <laughs> Wesley Snipes, who arguably stole the show. I mean, I saw White Man Can't Jump and, and he's been around. He was in Dolomite is my name, but still consistently delivered. As General Izzy, consistently funny, consistently ironic. He's like Bruce Willis. And I know that's, that sounds like a strange comparison, but, but Bruce Willis wasn't known for action roles. He was on Moonlighting. We talked about where the action genre shifted from the big muscly dudes to the more scrawny kind of normal guys. And I think Die Hard was a big part of that. And everyone was like, what? Bruce Willis is an action star. And so Wesley Snipes did his thing and his blades and all that stuff. But then when he's called upon to do comedy, he really delivered. He shined as General Izzy. He was consistently delightful and hilarious. And he walked that weird balance of being of trying to be menacing but being oh, I, thought um, meant, I thought you meant you walk that walk which is equally funny oh well there's that too. but he just like perfectly captured the tone his ending his resolution was very weird and abrupt but his performance yeah. was great yeah i didn't understand why he was suddenly so happy i think it was because eddie murphy had, had somehow released his sister from the curse and he was like well it's all right all good yeah, but all he had to do was say, Imani, you are released. Right? <laughs> and then she was still barking. By the way, you called that in our review of the original Coming to America. She's still hopping. You totally her. called. You were like, she's hopping and ooing somewhere. <laughs> I didn't think that they would carry that quite that far. It was as though nothing had changed. Right. I mean, it, it didn't really evolve. Zamunda didn't evolve. America certainly did. And so maybe that's our segue. I was all on board and inevitably we're going to America. So we'll see. And obviously it was going to be different. And it was going to I thought maybe this is kind of like the pickle where Herschel comes out of suspended animation and oh, the American world is different. Pickle. And let's do the, the what did I call it? The pickle. Yeah. Well, an American pickle where Herschel comes out of stasis and, you know, the world is crazy. And what's this cell phone? And he's all confused. It's not altogether different. And then they were in America for like 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then so like Seoul, when they get back to Zamunda, I'm like, well, that was too brief to justify the title of coming to America. Maybe they will go to America two times. But it started to get a little, you know, once they brought the kid back and I was dubious about this kid, uh, a legend has it that Ryan Coogler sat down with Eddie Murphy and pitched his version with the ever-present Michael B. Jordan as the son. Mm. And I think that would have been a good fit, maybe on the nose, but I was worried when this kid stepped in. And I was like, wait, so they are going to do the sun route. Obviously, we knew that from the trailer, but with this unknown kid, how far is that going to go? And then they rested a lot of weight squarely on this kid's shoulders. A lot of weight. We spent a lot of time with Lavelle. Coming to America was basically the lion that he had to come to terms with, that he had to overcome to be able to, to carry a lot of this and to not be established and to vaguely be Eddie Murphy funny without trying to ape him like they did in in uh, Bill and Ted face the music where the daughters were just way too Bill and Ted. Especially Theodora. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once the princely test began, then it started to lag, the inevitable lag. And I was like, okay, we'll see how it goes. And it was capped with the terrible CG across the board. Oof. The lion especially. And Kelly said they couldn't have gotten a real elephant. And for that one, at least, I think they might have been able to do it. I think Eddie Murphy would have called up like his buddy Mike's zoo or something, if that's still around, and been like, hey, can we borrow the elephant? Even Baba or the elephant got a cameo? Seriously? Yeah, they went all the way. And when they do that, you have to admire how closely they tied it to because people love it so much. And every one of those, almost without exception, brought a smile to my face. But I agree. We spent a little bit too much time with Lavelle. Now, his mom, Mary Johnson, played by Leslie Jones, was I was surprised at how much weight was put on her shoulders as well. Yeah, and a long-standing SNL cast member. Uh, Eddie Murphy seems to pluck from that cast, even though he hadn't been a part of it in like 30 years, over 30 years. But also Colin Jost, who uh, interviewed Lavelle for the job. And for the first time, as much as I like Colin Jost, Mr. Scarlett Johansson, in fact, but I think that is the point for me that it started to lag. 
I was like, where's Eddie Murphy? We need to keep Akeem on top of things. And while I'm like, yep. we're with this kid. And even Michael B. Jordan, I don't think, would have had the power where I would have felt comfortable with all of it being on his shoulders. Yeah, I hear you. Like when Lavelle and the royal groomer take their little walk in the garden, I was like, eee. Yep. A scene with just the two of them was necessary, but kind of uncomfortable. And so that was the point at which the movie tipped its hat a little bit. It's like, okay, I can see where this is going. But then that was shaken up a little bit when I thought that he had to be Sammy's son. When I thought inevitably he's not going to be Eddie Murphy's son because that would piss Lisa off. And it seemed like the Leslie Jones thing was a misdirect because he barely remembered it anyway, if at all. And then he got a little bit too close to the princess. I was like, eee, this is strangely icky for brothers and sisters. But I thought he was going to end up with the princess because it would be revealed that he wasn't, in fact, Akeem's son. Oh, that would have been an interesting twist. Akeem, you have us on. Man, James Earl Jones not looking altogether well. I hope that dude is all right. Yeah, I mean, they played it up because he was supposed to be on his deathbed. I hope. Now, the but back to your twist, I think that could have been interesting because Semi has a history of impersonating the prince. Maybe the vision could have been misconstrued, like, oh, it's the prince's son, when, right. when in actuality it was just Semi, like, fronting. In the same way that Semi enjoys the luxuries of Zamunda. You know, he's a, he's a son of Zamunda. Yeah, you know, um, I think that that would have worked perhaps better for me because they wouldn't have had to rush the royal wedding I, d I just didn't understand what urgency Lavelle and the royal groomer had to get married. Like, why did they have to rush to America and rush to that chapel to get married, other than to give Arsenio Hall's reverend character a cameo? Yeah, it was like, look, we got to get that character in sooner than later. They're going to have to hop on this marriage thing. <laughs> <laughs> because it all seemed, I feel like the script was secondary to other objectives, right? This script has problems, <laughs> but we forgive it. I mean, for the most part. Eddie Murphy would disagree about the problems. Spent four years in gestation. He mentioned that they had been trying to make Beverly Hills Cop happen for 10 years. Can't get the right script. So he was satisfied with this script and said that he wasn't going to do it until it was right. And he felt it was right. But, it, you know, by the necessity of structure and getting all these people in line, uh, these cameos in particular, uh, yeah, there were problems. I thought it was very dangerous the second time they went back, when Akeem was like, Sammy, you stay here in case General Easy should attack, and then went to America by himself. I'm like, wait, the second time he's going without Sammy? And then, of course, we weren't without Arsenio Hall for more than five minutes. Because right. New York City is populated with Arsenio Hall and Eddie Murphy characters. <laughs> Well, and we also intercut Eddie Murphy's second visit to America with Arsenio, with Semi throwing down and holding down the palace in Wakanda. In Wakanda. <laughs> Zamunda. You know, everybody knew that that was going to happen, right? I mean, they, oh, yeah. they referenced Wakanda in the movie. <laughs> I don't I still don't know if it quite excuses it, but I mean we were talking about Michael B. Jordan, so let's talk about Arsenio Hall because I feel he was kind of wasted as semi, but he made up for it as Reverend Brown and Morris and Baba. Baba. The Rafiki character. Kelly was almost immediately put off. I want to put on record, by the way, that you brought up Rafiki, not me. I get that. <laughs> Why? James Why? Earl Jones has a connection to the Lion King. I get that it's set in Africa, but you just compared a human character to Rafiki the baboon. And that um, wasn't me. That was you. I, I don't think that that was left to be guessed at. And Wesley Snipes, General Izzy, was the inspiration for Mufasa. So come on. The original? Because General Izzy was in Coming to America, played by a different actor. General Izzy was? Yeah, he was father to Imani. Oh, that's right. But in his introduction, he's introduced as the inspiration for Mufasa and the most well-endowed man in, in Africa, which is later contested in this movie by Eddie Murphy's uh, foreskin. Yes. By by Akeem's uh, shriveled foreskin. What, what was the Rafiki character's name? Is that a thing? Name? Do you keep foreskins? I, I don't know. I know that people have kept the little belly button thing that falls off yeah, in I have like those. books. Oh my god, I have no idea. So why not keep foreskin? It's not. It's not sexual. It's it's equally as weird. Well, I mean, the difference with the belly button um, umbilical cord piece is that everybody has one, whereas you know what? So the not other everyone gets so, a foreskin. So the, that Arsenio Hall character, his name was what? 
Baba? Baba. <laughs> Baba, whose last name is undoubtedly Yaga. <laughs> but, man, <laughs> Kelly was immediately put off. She was like, I don't like it. I don't like it. It's not right. And I never exactly pinned that down. Because Baba became a character that wasn't just like the, the witch that lurches out of the underground cavern or something. Baba was present pretty consistently throughout. And I thought it was a good Arsenio Hall character. This is the strangeness of this movie. When we inevitably go back to My T Sharp and everyone is in there except for Cuba Gooden Jr. who is having some problems. All I was happy to see all those characters. Maybe Semi was wasted, but I was happy that Semi was there. And I wasn't like, oh, well, they flopped that one. That was a terrible appearance. In a strange way, these characters, their alternate, Eddie Murphy's and Arsenio Hall's alternate characters, shined. And I feel like I got less. I got short, I was short shrifted on Semi and Akeem. Mm. And I felt like Eddie Murphy was wiser, older, more dignified. He was actually the king. But there were some moments, like the full face smile when he's pushing the mop and stuff. Yeah. Um, where he's happy and he's like, in the face. And I'm very happy to be here. And very little did Akeem outburst. And probably the same for Arsenio Hall, except when they were in those characters where Randy Watson was spot on and everybody and the barbershop guys didn't miss a step. I thought it was all great. It's just they're not kids anymore. And I think it kind of showed none so more evident than when it, when Akeem is pushing the broom around sadly and it was all sad and no funny. <laughs> pushing the mop around. Oh, when he has his heart to heart with Cleo. Yeah, which is good and all. Everything is good. And it was the obligatory connection scene that just kind of wasn't funny. And I'm not saying that coming to America wasn't funny, but sometimes it wasn't funny. We mentioned, I mentioned in our Coming to America, the original review, that this movie didn't have to be funny on every beat because it was kind of comfort food. And I guess in that way, Coming to America, the sequel worked because everybody was there and a lot of it was funny. It felt like something or someone was missing, and I cannot imagine what that would be. I don't think it's John Landis, the director of the original. Maybe it was the music. I think the music was a pretty driving mm. force, and it was mm -hmm. pretty on the nose with performances, like celebrity performances here. But the score mm -hmm. was strong in the first one, particularly the King's theme that I featured mm -hmm. in, our, in our other episode. I just felt mm -hmm. like something was a little dry. It was like seeing your favorite performer who's still solid, but who isn't playing Madison Square Garden or the Staples Center in L.A., but is now playing like a dinner country club or something, you know? It's the <laughs> same magic. You... It's just it's just a little bit muted. They don't turn the volume up as much. <laughs> we are missing Little Sister and Daryl. Patrice but, and Daryl, yeah. But I don't think that that is what you're feeling. I think you put your finger on it before. I think you missed more time with Akeem and Semi. I mean, that duo and their dynamic was so central to the original Coming to America. And and we just didn't get a lot of that in favor of getting everything else. You know, like I could have done without maybe Tracy Morgan's character. We had a lot of Mary, although she was quite she was actually quite delightful, even though her comedy, even though the comedy that she was given was maybe a little dated. I could have definitely spent a lot less time with Lavelle. I mean, I think that unless they were trying to set him up for a spinoff as the genuine heir of the Coming to America franchise, I was like, I don't, we don't really need that much, actually. I got nothing against this kid. I think for what he did, he was more memorable than the character that we were presented with deserved to be. I think he was solid because he felt grounded and real and, and, and not doing as much of an impression. <laughs> My favorite part with him in the movie, though, what definitely was him doing an impression when he was like, I got the whiskers, <laughs> they're from the lion. Yeah, but that was in the credits. And honestly, is it just me or did that <sighs> brief credits outtake scene contain the coming to America that we wanted to see? Like, that's all we really needed? No, when Eddie Murphy is doing the, like, animal noises and trying to get the lion to come to him in that credit outtake scene, I was yeah. like, yeah, right. Where is that Eddie Murphy? Where is that Akeem? Mm -hmm. And it seems like on Coming to America, they were having fun, having a great time getting everybody back together. And I think that they could wrap and go home and be like, we did a good job, which I think they did. What didn't work for me was any moment where they didn't have fun. Like any time that Prince Akeem and Lisa were like frowny faced, 
I was like, yeah. mm, we don't need to pretend that there's dramatic heft and weight to this film. Like, let's just keep the whole thing light and funny. This movie should have ended in six weddings. Arsenio Hall should have gotten married. Uh, uh, Tracy Morgan's Uncle Reem should have found a bride. Mary, Mary like, Damani. Sure, yes. They, they um, could have formed Arsenio's Mary... new dog pound. <laughs> Mary should have found a Zamundin. Like, this thing should have been six weddings and a funeral. And we would have been happy. Yeah, <laughs> six weddings. <right> here. <laughs> because the funeral was the biggest celebration we had, right? The we I didn't care enough about Lavelle and the royal groomer to you know feel pretty much anything at their wedding. The funeral was our big celebration. We got that right up top. And the opulence would have lent itself well, where we have the big wedding scene that maybe we would have expected at the end of coming to America, and then have multiplied times six. Wouldn't have been bad. Talking about the uh, Sherry Headley character. Lisa? Yeah, she appeared, and I'm not sure she said more than a couple words up top. And by the time he went to America, which is where I thought we were going to spend the majority of our time in this movie, I was like, we're not going to have her to... She was like a glorified cameo. Is she like... I was like, did they put her in a movie out of courtesy, but something happened where she can't act anymore? And so when we got back and Lisa actually participated and she wasn't dry and wooden and she seemed fun and with it and still the Lisa from the old movie, I was happy about that. But kind of all we got from her was frowny face because rightfully so. Lisa was Jenny from the block. Like, had she so completely converted to her Zamunda royalty self that she, I mean, I guess that's the idea, right? That both Akeem and Lisa forgot where they came from that was the whole point right that lisa had lost her way just as akim did and they both had to kind of refine themselves and mary helps lisa and and lavelle helps helps akim and lisa and akim have the closest thing to a real emotional wedding where they (laughs) they kind of unofficially renew their vows yeah in that sweet little moment and i thought and that was the moment where i thought this is what this movie is about this movie is about everyone being happy and true love triumphing and and fun yeah because there weren't a lot of actual stakes the only thing we were holding on was tradition and the idea that the general would storm the castle or the the palace i guess but uh that was really the only stakes and it was about being happy and fuzzy and uh, there weren't a lot of surprises but when lisa came around and it, it was a frowny moment she didn't really have a joyful happy moment for her character per se where she got to act it out but I was happy that she actually got to act and she's very present and fun. And she looked regal and royal. She was really great when she settled back into her character. She had to get drunk and loose to do it. If you're going to bring her back, it's important that she hit the right notes. And I think she did. Who else are we missing? We did Morgan Freeman. That's the problem. It feels like we have everybody. Who else could you possibly want? And yet it felt like something was amiss. (laughs) Oh, that's not what you're referring to. You're literally saying, who of the long list of cameos are we forgetting to discuss? Well, we're not really discussing Craig Brewer. Nope. Uh, and I'm happy enough with Craig Brewer because my personal taste is that Dolomite Is My Name wasn't funny. I think it had the, all the hallmarks of an Eddie Murphy comedy and never made me happy. And coming to America, for the most part, made me happy. And I didn't know that Craig Brewer had it in him to make me happy in a comedy sense are we maybe being a little bit generous like if we take a step back like look at the duke and duke scene like really so we had the randall and and, uh, mortimer scene or his their offspring and like i said that's where it kind of lagged for me colin jost also pulled from saturday night live head writer on saturday night live and then in kind of a nothing throwaway scene it was there simply to help create this new story but comedically, can we really overlook just like how dated and kind of irrelevant that comedy is? Like, are we really saying anything by being like, oh, this uppity white company is discriminating against this young black professional who is just looking for his break? They use that word uppity in the movie. And she's like, I'm not uppity. And I'm finding I'm hearing that that word is inappropriate because I said that word like Favi is uppity derogatory. 
Uh, I mean, I don't know. I was I mean, thinking if you're about applying it to black people, I guess. And like, honestly, I'm, I'm being serious here. Like uppity slaves, like that is how that term like, yeah, you, the slaves can't get out of line. They, they can't get uppity. We have to put them in their place kind of vibe I mean, because you, you used it for the opposite of slaves. You used it for Colin <laughs> Jost, who Leslie Jones herself on SNL has called like the whitest cupcake in America or whatever. <laughs> I mean, is uh, slave from the future racist? Listen, <laughs> that was in every hilarious. St- <laughs> and honestly, as much as it was, could have been cheesy, the dialogue was really clever. In every, I agree with you. In every single episode of or whatever movies, and you can put this in our hundredth episode special. It's probably appropriate. I ask, is this racist? <laughs> Like this, this consistently, I do not know. I've had inclusion training, formal inclusion training at work. I have done the uh, me and white supremacy workbook. Like this is top of mind for me. And I just don't know. It's I don't know. It's an ever changing thing. It's it's it's, it's a moving target. Uh, it's an evolving subject or whatever. I'm I am not the expert. I ask it to you literally in every review and I, just, and I just don't know. We violate all the rules. The rules are don't speak, don't post anything on the internet because the internet is forever, and create no entertainment so that you can uh, annoy or offend anyone, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Great. Well, that's easy. I mean, we're in a weird place where we don't fit anywhere, and we are assigned racial identities or something that, that are never going to stick because there's no one like, oh, well, apparently there's one person like us. But... Uh, <laughs> But I don't know. Just the idea well, of you, you, you and white supremacy with a little workbook is funny to me. What's well, it? It's like important to me. Like we're people of color, but we are white passing or we've probably attempted to be white passing for the majority of our life in order to have the privileges of white people. But as soon as. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm going to stop you right there. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I can't get away from this idea that while everything was in place. Something was just a little bit off, and I don't know if it's possible that that chasm could have been surmounted. Can you surmount a chasm better than they did in this movie? Everybody was present, but here's an example that I think fits. At the end, they built up, you know, who could it be? Oh, my God, oh, my God, is it Mary J. Blige? And they were all excited, and they built up that excitement for a long time. Who could it possibly be that's going to appear? It's the best performer ever. And we knew exactly who it was, right? Sexual chocolate. And the reason we knew that Randy Watson was inevitable, at least me, well, we could have guessed because everyone else made an appearance, but also they showed Eddie Murphy as Randy Watson in the trailer. So it was so easy, so accessible, and so obvious that I projected twists on this movie because I was like, this is obviously where they're going, that they didn't do. And it wasn't like, oh, they tricked me. Oh, it was clever. It just kind of nothing happened. I was like, they're going to do this. They're going to do this. You're like, oh, I can't wait for the six weddings in like true Zamunda style would have made this movie hilarious. They It kind of petered out at the end. And Randy Watson's appearance, although I smiled and laughed the entire time, still in some strange way anticlimactic. And I think that Coming to America, the original, just too closely tied to not only the zeitgeist, but to our childhoods. So I think they did the best they could. I think they threw everything at us in the tightest, funniest, most concise way possible in a way that worked 89% of the time. It was kind of like we grew up down on McDowell's and we were like, man, it's good. Like, mm, give me some more of that sauce. And we were like, rah, 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 rah. and then afterwards we were like, I kind of feel like a little sick. Yeah. It was like a really satisfying, <laughs> cheap meal. It's the perfect movie, I think, to watch some scenes again on YouTube. So I think that about sums it up. You can't review Coming to America outside of the original context, right? So these, this is not a movie that you would recommend necessarily apart from having seen the original But as part and parcel, what's your rating? This podcast friend Eric Shamlin asked when I told him I had seen it, any good? And I said, worth seeing. Because you have to see this movie. If you love these characters, this will further them in an insubstantial way, I guess. I was happy to have everybody back. I was happy with the movie. Uh, It didn't wow me. I can't. But we didn't even give commit to a totally rating for, for coming to America. Coming to America, the sequel, lands in that same zone. It's almost critic proof. You're going to love it or you're not. And I'm guessing that depends on whether or not you love the first movie. I'm going to give it an all right rating. 
And there you have it, an all right from Wes, a good from Iris. I just can't fault this movie for any of its shortcomings because ultimately I was satisfied. 818-835-0473. That's our hotline. Let us know what you think about Coming to America, Amazon Prime original film, or whatever movies at gmail.com. Follow us at Instagram at or whatever movies. Thank you for listening and Wakanda forever. Where did I?